what was actually happening in America during the the lead up to the Civil War, and even more importantly, what what did life look like before all this? What what did this crazy world look like before it? And before that, Intel. What that's it. Man's deadliest weapon was Intel. It's always been that way, but even more so back in the day when. Intel could come from a variety of rogue sources, many of which were guerrilla. Guerrilla information used to run this world. Uh, you would get information and it could come from a wide variety of sources. And, and the very first thing that people did in an effort to control you because you were a powerful, beautiful species, they're going to want to control you. Who wouldn't want to control you? I mean, come on, look at yourself. God, oh, God. oh man, I want to make you my slave looking at you right now. So it's like, how do you do that? You're going to have to control the deadliest weapon you have, which is intel, which is information. And, and this is nothing new, but I do think that we miss a lot uh, in reference to just how profound this, this, this thing is. And uh, uh, I'm assuming you're looking at my slides now, and uh, oh, thank you. And uh, I'm showing you a caricature of Nathan Meyer Rothschild. And in 1815, Nathan uh, Meyer Rothschild laundered British government bonds with the exclusive intel of Napoleon, uh, Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo. I know many of you know this, but I just want to really put this in your mind, just how valuable this information was. This uh, literally created this family out of nothing or out of something. It created them into something, 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 something. And it was strictly because they had intel that no one else did. And this isn't an oddity. This goes back to Rome. The triumvirates of Rome knew a lot of things. Uh, they knew what they were going to be proposing years to come sometimes. And you would just slowly find out what they had in store for you. And so it's not that it's new, but but the eclipse of a new country. See what I did there? It gives you an opportunity to see the penumbra and and actually look directly at this this other source. And this other source is the is the competition for the deadliest weapon of all, which is Intel. And Rothschild, the Red Shield family, uh, certainly certainly uh, capitalized on this. But as Nathan, you know, is saying here, he's he's asking, am I being detained? He he there's no crime to hoard information. Even today, there's not that's not actually a crime. In fact, we build our government off of that. And I've told you this before, but judges, police officers, uh, have a constitutionally protected right to lie to you that is built into the endeavors of what it takes to build a criminal justice system, that the idea of curtailing intel and using it against you is a valuable tool of government. It's not going anywhere. It's not a product even of of evilness. It's a product of how do I wield a proper sword to cut off any head that's going to try and oppose me? And ultimately, when you want a government, you're looking for someone to provide you with a unionized sense of, of boss. You, you accept that there's a big boss. You accept that the big boss is cruel and evil. You just want it to be one guy. And you, you kind of want it to be able to predict, okay, for the next four years, this is the big boss. I can deal with that. He has some idiosyncrasies, you know, and and... I'm safe over here and I can hide over here and I can change my entire religion and, and sacrifice to different things over here if, if it means that, that I can stay alive or, uh, longer. And that most of the settlers that, that came to uh, the old world and were trying to declare it a new world were really stuck with this idea of, oh, fuck, uh, we don't have a gang. Everyone else here has gangs. There's, there's things called tribes. And man, they are looking sweet. They got their shit together, these tribes do. And we want a tribe too. We want a gang too. And we're lazy and we're hyena and, and we're 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 kind of we're kind of kind of very feral. And so it become quite natural for the entire scenery of Gangs of New York, that that uh really powerful movie, I think gives you a a, a good look right up until you know, the bigger Hollywood stars come into it. It's like a really good movie. And then once you see Cameron Diaz, I mean, nothing against her, or, but just like once you see them, you're kind of like, oh, oh yeah, this is Hollywood. And then before then you're like, holy fuck, this is intense. And I, I think it really does capture well this 
this idea that that you you're living in a wilderness that just has stories. Just just trees have been stacked in a certain way that you can climb stairs and live, you know, uh, higher up and that you're still, it's still the wilderness. It's still the wild. And most of the wild was being run uh, really by intel, by the ability to predict that an eclipse was coming and then tell everyone, if you do not obey me, an eclipse is going to come and then that eclipse come. And this happened with fires. <laughs> uh, this happened with uh, a massive theft. Uh, pillaging and rape, there'd be certain ceremonies, uh, sometimes uh, in line with the full moon, where a certain the the dead rabbits. I'm sure you've heard this this name uh, would declare that the streets are ours tonight, and so we're going to uh, basically clockwork orange our way around town. And that if you're living in New York and you're watching a bunch of people wandering around with jock straps uh, singing songs, you're you're, you're kind of like, hey, it'd be kind of cool if we had some order around here. So I, I I'm not blaming what new york was doing it was doing what everyone else was doing which is just trying to trying to relax <laughs> just trying to find a way to accept what where we are but at the same time elicit some control while also preserving some freedom and and honestly the kind of it kind of conglomerated into the best possible scenario we have now y you could definitely argue our system's fucked I, I don't mind i think that's a healthy sign but but when you look at the tiddlywinks, man, this could have come out a lot worse. It, it it really could have. And most of most of what I see has happened to us is our own fault. And when I say fault, I really mean choice. But I want to allow us to say fault because if we can call it a fault, we can let go of that power and say, oh, we don't have responsibility. This is done. And so as you're learning this, you're really seeing the – the hyena literally begging for a master. I think that's really what was happening in the Civil War is people were begging for a master of some kind. As long as they elicited this Kono Takarius, this, this village burner attitude that we used to call George Washington. That was his original name, as you know. And so the, the people that were the epic, the ones in charge back then, were utilizing the power of the eclipse, were understanding that Napoleon just lost, but I will not share everyone that news yet. First, I will buy or sell all these bonds or, or set up all these other things to profit from it instead. That truly is the person that that was considered good for, I, I think still today, I think we have a nasty misunderstanding of what good means. Good typically does mean the one who's willing to be righteous enough to do whatever it takes to get what he wants. It, I know that sounds fucked, very nihilistic even, but it, if you look at it from a pure entitlement perspective, this is a, a much closer way of looking at, at at what we would even call reality right now, I think. We just pretend like it's civilized, which is fine. You're about to see why, I think, because um, – uh, of course, Nathan Meyer Rothschild, I'm going to have to take a, a quick little uh, sidestep here, ladies and gentlemen, because I just want to point out that this guy was born in the city of Frankfurt. He died in the city of Frankfurt, and his middle name is Meyer. And if you put those things together, you have Frankfurts and you have Meyers. And if you consider this idea, I want you to look even deeper at the conspiracy that could be the hot dog manufacturing conspiracy that this man, Oscar uh, F. Meyer was of German descent and had this connection to Frankfurt and that this whole thing could have been some sort of secret plot that we don't know about that is still unfolding. I'm not going to stay on this point because I think some of you guys aren't ready for this kind of depth in uh, in this new eclipse, okay? But just keep in mind, this dude was, was coming to his rise too, right? 1859, he was watching all this happen. Okay, let's get back to the show. In May of 1846... This is a, a big deal because the Associated Press was actually founded in 1846 by this guy, Moses Yale Beach, the same Yale uh, that, that the university is named after, very much the arbiter of the beginnings of the gang gangification of America into something that we would eventually call a federal or a country. And that this gentleman in 1846 – was watching the ability to capitalize on the information that was pouring in from uh, the Mexican-American War. And he was able to take this information and do the same thing Rothschild did and withhold, predict, and scoop everyone else. And, and in this way, he was able to control the propaganda that came into the city simply because he had certain information that others didn't. This gave him twofold. First, it gave him the scoop, the idea that he, he knew the news first. But secondly, it gave him the ability to actually shape 
what the information contained as it came into the city. In order for him to do this, this speech character uh, needed to build an underground railroad of intel, a secret society to pass information. And he knew that the only place to start that for the Mexican-American War was in Montgomery, Alabama. And so he went to Montgomery, Alabama, and he established the, the underground listening ear of, the, of what we now today call the Associated Press. And the goal of that place was to gather intel uh, collected in, in Montgomery and to sneak that intel up north to New York City. So you're, you're looking at what you might first thought of to be the antithesis of the Associated Breath Press is, in fact, privileged, secret information. And that the success of the New York Times was purely built on this monopoly that had been set. And this monopoly required a lot of engineering, a lot of different skills to invoke this this was not as simple as as uh, oh I'll I'll post this to my to my Facebook page. This involved an underground railroad of ships, telegraphs, horseback, and even encryption. And as I said before, step one it began in, in what was then the Confederate capital of the Mississippian culture, Amu Raka, the Southern Amu Raka. The you could maybe call it Turtle Island is probably the best thing you could probably refer to it as, and that the southern capital of Turtle Island was really Montgomery, Alabama, and that if you were going to call this place a new world and you got here and there was already pretty big places there, you'd have to go to those places and kind of like hoop there and stuff. You you sort of have to like leave your stuff there and like park your car, and eventually over time people would just start to understand that you created this space that you're the one that, that made this happen. And so step one really was inserting this ear, this listening device in the very heart of the South itself in Montgomery. So whoops, where happened to step two? Step two, believe it or not, was a stagecoach posse that was traversing all the way from Montgomery uh, through the Appalachian foothills into Virginia where they had already uh, established a telegraph office. And so right away, you're understanding, wait a minute, James, so they were already stagecoaching things at that time. And yes, they were. Why? Because there was already a thriving culture here. There was already a highway. Most of Chattooga, most of the reason why so many states are are separated in a certain point. If you look at the points of Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama, and Georgia, all of those the, the, the lines are separating what used to be a pretty big center. And that the way that you would separate a land is, is to divide it up, give it names like Caroline, things like that. Uh, other names that, that you can slowly start to insert yourself into. You're not going to be able to do this on all the words. You're not going to be able to convince people that can we stop calling it Ottawa and call it Williamtown? No, people are like, no, it's Ottawa. Same for Chattanooga. Same for Kuala, same for all of uh, most of the towns that you see that still have this remnant footprint of a Native American name. I think you're looking at the conglomerate intel war of we order you to call it Jonestown and no, we're not doing that. And that you're just watching the, the, the seasoning of culture agree. And so if you really want to look back at what the Civil War was – it's a battle over what was already here, and the only way that you could claim that is you couldn't just change things. You had to take what was already here and just kind of guide it. We, we talked about this, how good Trump is at this. You want to pace it. You're going to want to pace the story that's there on the land and slowly turn it into something else as you're about to see. So it, riding stage crosses through some of the the, the most treacherous uh, mountain terrain, seriously, the 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 – Southern mountains should not be underestimated. And the only way that you could pull that off on a stagecoach is if people have been traveling that way a long, long time, like a long, long time. Things like the Appalachian Trail, the Pacific Northwest Trail, uh, the Natchez Trace Trail, all these are considered uh, national park treasures, but really they're just ancient Roman roadways before Rome was here. And that as long as we uh, ignore what they are, we just have to dismiss them as, well, those are bunny trails, really advanced bunny trails, deer trails from a long time ago. Uh, 
And, and step three, after you make it to Virginia, then you're able to actually wire the, as I said, telegraph the information that you want directly into New York. And of course, you're the only one receiving that telegram because you've encrypted this data, which means you have as much leeway time as you need to capitalize on as much data as you want. And New York was just a giant Burning Man festival, a giant mosh pit of give me a belief and I'll try it on and I'll run through the city and see. I'm a Mohawk now. I'm a uh, Scotch Irish. I'm a dead rabbits. I'm a gang because I want to survive. And if I want to live in this place, if I'm not an indentured servant, if I'm not a slave, holy fuck, I'm going to have to join the Crips or the Bloods. And so you do. But back then you had so many more choices. You had so many more choices of who and what you would become. And some of those choices were so tempting, so lusciously promising that it became impossible to say no. Uh, in 1861, Montgomery, Alabama succeeded from the Union and joined the Confederate States of America, which established its first capital, Montgomery. The state legislature conscripted soldiers and appropriated several million dollars for military operations and for the support of the families of soldiers. You go there, you build a capital, and you call it capital. This is the capital. <laughs> and you do things inside. And you you walk around and you go harumph. <clears throat> harumph. Harumph. And if you harumph inside of a brown building for enough time and you keep saying it's the capital, and you get enough people to agree that this is the capital, you you end up with the capital. It's, it, this is not that hard. It's it's part of the – even the word capital was like, wait, wait, wait what? We're the, we're the center of this? Hey, that's great. I would love to be the center of the state of – wait, what are we calling this place again? Alabama? Okay, sure, sure. That's what you called it when I got here. Same thing as Rome, you know, it's Romulus and Remus. That's this is what happened. And so coming back to New York, people are begging for something to taste. They're begging for a task. Give me something to do. And you end up with the Woodstock, the very first Woodstock, which occurred in 1861. A hundred thousand people gathering in the streets of New York. Why were they gathering there? This was called the most patriotic event ever held in the city at the time. The largest group of Americans ever gathered in what uh, in one place filled the streets of Union Square for what purpose? In support of the Union. Now you, the historian, the learner of history was told that 200,000 people were in Union Square because they believed in the Union and they believed in the abolishment of slavery and they believed that the hot and tot ninjas, the racist hot and tot ninjas were out there, the outlaws, and that we had to protect ourselves from them. And that this is what's required because you're literally dealing with a tribe of people that if you play the right music, they will start killing each other. That you can come in and whistle Yankee Doodle Dandy and bring enough strife, enough emphasis that, that children will walk down to the river and drown themselves because that's how intoxicating the social atmosphere is. And it's no different than the Crips or the Bloods and you being handed a gun at 12 saying, I need you to kill someone randomly that you don't know because it would break you enough to where you could become one of us. And this is no different than saying, hey, put your penis on the barrel. Let's cut off your foreskin because you're 12 now and it's time to join our cult. This is nothing new. If anything, we've gotten just more subtle and more uh, more dreamy about, about the story. The story has to have a little bit more oomph to it now. We have to believe that there's a clear enemy and a clear victor. And that if we don't do this, we're going to burn in hell. And, you know, it, it just requires a little bit more of that song. That song just requires a little bit more twiddles and flash bombs and, and things like that to, to get us going. But really at the heart of all human culture is this desire to be led in a fervor. To, to experience a kind of religious ecstasy simply by being surrounded by a group, it's no different than a song. It's like, what are we playing? Oh, it's quiet, right? Fuck yeah, man. Come on, feel the noise. It doesn't matter. You're there to dance. You're not there to listen to Quiet Riot. You're there to dance. And so if it's Quiet Riot, if it's Dead Kennedys, if it's Butthole Surfers, it, it, you're just, you just want to be there. You just want to interact, right? 
And so you're going to don the colors of the time. You're going to, you're going to find that the same eighties hairband hairspray things that were happening now were happening back then, but it was just on a much more fundamental level as far as like how we understood our own sense of value, our own sense of what we were even doing here. The mayor at the time of New York, Fernando Wood, got his uh, hidden hand here. I'm not saying he's a Mason. I'm not saying he's not a Mason. Well, I'm not even bringing up the Mason. You brought it up, not me. I'm just, I'm just saying that that it's interest. This is kind of a cool, and that nearly uh, he's descri described at the time. Nearly every building in Manhattan was adorned in flags. Broadway was hidden in a cloud of flaggery. There are flaggeries everywhere, exclaimed one writer. Despite the sober purpose of the event, think about this, New Yorkers treated it, as they always did then, like a party. Costumes, lively music, public drunkenness. This was a spectacle, right? You would think that from the spectacle of all New York was solidly on the Union's court. In fact, a great man, many New Yorkers sided with the Confederacy including one of the speakers that day, the mayor himself, Fernando Wood. This mayor had just proposed three months earlier that New York secede along with the South. But now three months later, as, as the city is burning around him, he comes out and announces, I'm willing to give up all sympathies, and if you please, all errors of judgment upon all national questions. He included in his speech, to much applause, the full text of his speech, basically saying that, that we are a union town. And if you do not conform to these ideas, you're gonna your house is gonna get burned down. And this this really was go time at this point, because when you look at what was happening in the street, not only were gangs uh, having their own intricacies, not only was the Irish literally trying to like start its own country and say, "No, this is our island. Manhattan is ours." I mean, it's it's. Everyone was ganging for whatever that 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 they could pull, and uh, I see the slides. Is, is everything okay? Wait, wait, wait. Share screen. Yeah, I'm getting ready to come back to it anyway. All right, everything's okay there, right? Um, okay, thanks. So, so the the, the fervor that was going on was necessary. Because you're not just going to be able to say, "And hey, welcome to NPR today. We're going to be talking about sweet potatoes." And how important they are as spring comes upon us. You, you know, you're gonna, you're not, it's not gonna work there. The propaganda then is gonna have to be something much different, much different. And so, just like in Rome, as you have these these festivals where people are parading through the streets, just looking for excuses to set things on fire, to loot if they need money, if they're hungry. It's like, yeah, let's just go, you know, start a ride at the food court. It's like, well, what's our purpose there? We're gonna ask for. Uh, better winter conditions. Yeah, it doesn't really matter if if people want to behave that way. It's going to rise to the top, and something like an eclipse, just something really minor, just the dropping of a fork, is going to set off what's nat necessarily naturally there. William Steinway from the very same piano company. They had just opened their factory in New York. Uh, you can see it there in the top right corner. A uh, pretty menacing building at the time. And uh, uh, William Steinway uh, wrote a diary about about what was happening in the city and that that at no point did he say this is the most patriotic July 4th celebration in the world. <laughs> no, 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 that's not what he was saying. He was like, oh, my God, this is the holy shit. Am I going to die? Are we going to lose the factory? There's so much war. There's so much fighting. Why? Because Prospect Building had just opened up a lottery where they were. They just were drawing your name randomly saying, hey, you now belong to us. You are now the property of the Union Army now. And you're going to report here and you're going to do this. And in 1863, people were like, what the fuck? What, why am I doing that? God bless them. They were like, what the fuck? Why am I doing that? And 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 it, and, and because you're looking at how much how much angst was flowing through the street, you didn't know who was in charge. Not only that, you've been watching for the last 10 years. Keep in mind, this is at least six years prior to the first shots, the even speaking of this of the Civil War for six years prior, gangs of New York were wandering through recruiting people to join our militia, join my militia. This is just like Hitler, just like Hitler rose by 
uh, parading through the streets with other gun owners. The same thing was happening in New York, where different factions were saying, "Hey, we got we got a we got a nice uh, arsenal here. You put on this fez hat, this this collar, these things, and you come with me. You 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 be one of us, and we'll be safe." It was a form of survival. Why? Because slavery had been abolished. What do you think is going to happen? This is this is people's natural inclination to to want to to team up. This is what serfs do. This is what uh, slaves do. This is what indentured servants do. The first th thing they do when they get off the boat, they just got so efficient that they did it before they left, that they were able to be promised something before they left. And that promise was a much cheaper deal than if they could have just bartered their own contract on the boat, came over here, and then entered it into indentured servitude. But this is no different than when you find someone and you say to him, hey, would you like to be a contractor with me? And they're like, no, I just want you to pay me a lot less, but just promise you'll always pay me if I show up. And that most of us are on that, on that, on that track right now. It's true. If you ask any entrepreneur, they will tell you a story where they try to inspire their employee to become a subcontractor and their employee's like, I don't want to do that. No, no, no. no. I, I want to show up and, and get a check, even if it's one tenth of, of what I could get if I just opened my eyes and kept my ears open. And it's okay. The psychology of being self-sufficient is expensive. And if you cannot afford it, it would be immoral for you to try. Does that make sense? And, and when we understand what America really is, it is the sacrifice of Koyo Shaokui, the Mesoamerican goddess we talked about, the rosy cheeks, the Liberty Bell. The reason why I cannot look up how many laws we have, there's, there's no way to count how many pages or words are in the national code because it goes into these volumes and then those volumes are replaced by other volumes that were before it. And before that, the records just aren't even that we don't even know. So we're constantly finding new laws that we passed. So if you think every year, every three days, we're passing a new law, you're just looking at the oldest Mesoamerican uh, fable existed of Coyoshaukli, which is like every year we will sacrifice more of our liberty to make our country grow. And so the government's doing wonderful. Well, like it's doing exactly what, what the land has asked for it to do. And I want you to look at it this way now that the eclipse is gone. I want you to look at it this way because I want you to understand that not only is this country not broken, this country is a living entity of the soil that utilizes this magic of the red and white. The rust belt that you hear about is the same red and white stripes of these old Aztec gods that were, their sole job was to grow children that would sacrifice their heart on a temple that was dedicated to either a blue weather god or a red war god. And the, and the, you know, I know you've heard me say this, forgive me choir, but this is the Republicans and the Democrats that we, the, so the land is speaking to us. And if the land has been speaking to you this long, who are we to say that's broken? If the land's been doing it this long, who are we to suggest that this is flawed? Is there upward mobility? I personally think it's harder harder to argue against that. And, and but we've had upper mobility since Rome. And and this ultimately I want you to understand I think the only reason why a government would work it's impossible to install a government that would not satisfy the needs of the people. And I think as long as the egregore sees an upward mobility it's fine with it. It's fine. Whatever you got to do, because I'm going to fucking lie to you anyway. I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to steal all your paper clips. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do all these things instead. So it, it, this is the sign that, 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 that things are good, right? Cameron, go ahead. Quite a while ago, you had uh, offered an insight about what we lost uh, when we, on academia, took on the uh, discipline of geology next to uh, the way like the Native Americans would describe a formation of a river. Yeah. And the way it rises uh, and and shapes itself uh, in good health. And this place, uh, right under a bridge on Highway 19, where the Octana got fastened, Octana Juganan dot Junyin. Octana is uh, figurative in a lot of our stories. Uh, this particular spot is where he got stuck crossing the Tuckasegee River, and. 
when he got stuck, anybody that saw, saw anybody hold a snake down on the ground to hold it by the head, watch his, you see its body thrash around, watch it try to break free. And that explains in our stories why we have all of these rocks in that river. Was that Tana got stuck there? The rocks gives you the horned serpent. You you see the the spikes of the horned serpent in the way that that the the rocks are shaped by the river. And uh, we talked about this a long time ago. I I had an excerpt from someone who had written something about this that was just really touching. Um, but yeah, the the animism is so much more uh, alive. If you're not settling here, if you haven't just been dumped here, when you're dumped here, you're going to see a lot less of Hades. You're going to see a lot less of the energy. You're going to, first thing you're going to do is build a palisade. You're, you're, you're going to construct it. It's weird. You're going to take the very trees from the forest, remove their roots, cut them into straight things, straight sticks, and then dig holes and then bury those sticks in the same ground you pulled them out of. And now you're going to feel safe. And now you're, Oh, I feel, I feel good. Now we have a fort and, and you're going to tell everybody in the fort, Hey, if you don't cut your hair, I'm going to kill you. Oh, well, what? yeah, man, I'm going to fucking kill you. If you don't cut your hair. And if you talk to these people, I'm going to kill you. And if you don't worship this, I'm going to kill you. And if you don't show up for church, I'm going to fucking kill you. That's, that's in the code. That's in the Jamestown code. It doesn't say I'm going to fucking kill you. Okay. I put that on, but it's, that's one of the commandments. If you're, if you're going to be in the, in the, the Croatan or the, the, sorry, the word escapes me right now, but this, uh, these civilizations, the first, uh, corporate civilizations that were trying to establish their, their foothold here, the, the rules were a lot more strict than you would possibly imagine. And those rules gave you stability because you felt that you were surrounded by someone who had, who had enough civilization in fact i think you're about to really see that um uh as i get down um if you guys cannot see the slide i'm going to hit share again but uh you should be able to see everything now and uh we're back here at uh, uh william steinway um the the piano guy um i wanted to i've got this in red i can't even remember what I, what i wrote but i wanted to read it william recounted that his brother charles met with some of the yeah 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 <laughs> This was not a noble cause, okay? The piano manufacturer, <laughs> William, uh, you know, again, he was the one reporting that this is a freaking mob. This is not a everyone's patriotic. These people are freaking mad. They're mad because obvious for obvious reasons. These guys were pro union, though. They wanted this, this federal conglomerate. And William recounted that his brothers Charles met with some of the rioters in an attempt to save their factory, and that and that he he. Uh, Charles went out and he met with the ringleaders and that he paid them 30 to $40 each. Um, and he ran out of money. One of them, he had to give a check, uh, a check for $30. And the idea is please just, just don't, don't burn down our factory. You can burn down any other factory. Just don't burn down our factory. And so the very idea that, that if you were enlisted, keep in mind that there were two people that were, that were uh, immune from, from this enlistment, there's a building that ran your name through the lottery. And if you came up, there's only two people that could not come up. One of those were, were former slaves. And the other was anyone who could, who could pay 300 bucks. And so you could, so not only are you living in a new land, not, not only are you, are you trying to survive and you're going to have to join a gang of some kind, but some of these gangs have gained so much power that they have, they have learned that they can in, inscript you. They can impress you. You, you wake up and you're on a ship and you've left port and you're so far away that you're going to drown. If you try and swim back, what are you going to do? This was the basis for building an economy back then. And if you didn't do it on a ship, you could do it on land as long as you had people terrified enough of what to expect. And so before you were being put on this boat in London, which was like, get you, I just need you out of here. There's too many rats here. We're going to put rats on boats and send them out because there's too many here. We're going to tell the rats you're going to love it there. There are four breasted Indian women that are there to fulfill your every desire. They're, they're going to feed you the, the finest pudding you've ever had. And it's going to be this luxury. They're going to treat you like kings. All the gold that you could possibly want is there, right? All the stories that you've heard 
we're the very first immigrant crisis because it's how you stir a pot. We still stir that pot now. I realize how we like to say how horrible it is for uh, countries in Europe, and it is because you're bringing in a bunch of migrants. But what you're really doing is you're exposing those feral people, I'm going to use that word, to non-feral people, and you're causing a regulation, a mass regulation. All those people are leveling up in the grossest, most <laughs> horrible way, and, and it's, a lot of atrocities are happening, and everyone's leveling up because of them. It's a, I think it's unavoidable personally, just because this is, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be around. We're going to be doing stuff like this. Someone's going to tell a story and it's not going to be about whether or not it's true. It's going to be about whether or not that dilates me more than the other stories I heard in America uh, was a, was a story. And I'll tell you, I didn't know this before today. Freedom of the press was invented by the Gatling gun. I did not know this. During the uh, riots, the inscription riots of 1863, 1861, 62, 63, people in New York were being told, you're going to wake up and you're going to be enlisted in something. And if you don't show up, we're going to kill you. And that people started to say, well, we have to stop this. So they went to the very heart that was to distributing this news, the New York Times office. And they were met with a new technology that had never been seen before. Fucking Gatling gun. An automatic turn crank weapon was owned not by the military, but by the New York Times. The founder of the New York Times not only was a gun lover, he was a Republican. <laughs> not only was he Republican, he wanted everyone to pay taxes. He wanted everyone to be inscripted underneath a singular tribe. If you think about all the tribes that were alive then, these men were insisting that we have to join a tribe. It wasn't a country, was it? It was just another tribe. And we are occupying the land where people would come to collect wood for their bows, Manhattan, or however it's pronounced, right? The Manhattan was just the field where people would come to gather, gather bows, wood for their bows. And you're living amongst these people, and you're ever everyone's tribing up. And so there's just a giant eagle tribe. There's a giant eagle tribe, and the only way you're going to get this to form is through brute force, a lot of propaganda, a complete constriction and elimination of any other sources of information, and a lot, a lot of propaganda. One of which is the story that we're only doing this because we want to free the black people. That is a story. And during this entire riots that were happening in New York... A lot, an orphanage, a black orphanage was burnt to the ground. Uh, uh, there's a, a giant settlement in New York of, of freed slaves. I'm using quotes because there were people here that weren't slaves that were all colors. The Seminole tribe was already, uh, a good part of that was already African-American. This, this idea of you entering into slavery is a psychological decision. And even the move on the boat even the ride over on the boat changed a lot of these people's psychology from a place of cannibalistic, my body has value because I have meat, to here's a place where I'm, I'm surrounded by people that, have, that are leveled up. They have this sense of private property. You, you know, guys, in Tanzania right now, like it's not even private property isn't even a thing. Like, like the people on the ground don't even have that as a concept. So you can imagine how much you would have no choice but to regulate around someone who's just simply pacing at a different level as you. You're going to slowly regulate to that person. And so the melting pot of America really causes the, the highest to lower themselves and the lowest to raise themselves up because it's just, it's just how, people, how people regulate with each other. We can't help it. It's why being in a social group really has no choice but to cause these kinds of things to happen but it should be profound to us all 
Because what I think happened is, is why would the New York Times have a, a secret weapon that no one else had? I think the military had that. And I think the reason why the military gave it to the New York Times was because the New York Times was the quintessential fountainhead for all the propaganda that was going to flow. If you did not control Montgomery, Alabama and New York, you did not control the flow of information. This is the birth of the Associated Press. And it happened during the Civil War because... It was the only way you could do it. It's the only way. Now, I've told you this before. We're going into a lot more now, but the Associated Press was found just five years after I mean, Reuters. Okay, Reuters might have been five years after. It's five years difference. I can't remember which one's first. So your entire modern world, our parents' modern world, our grandparents' modern world, and even our great-grandparents' modern world have all been fed off two nipples of American propaganda. And those two nipples have never changed. Never have they changed. And only now, only now are people like me saying, hey, that's fucked. That's fucked. Why are we calling this news? Why are we saying that today Reason Magazine told me, uh, well, yeah, James, uh, Former uh, conservative Orthodox Americans have really uh, lost favor with Biden because Biden uh, let, uh, let, let this down on his promise to provide better shoes for a military. It's like, it's like, no, they didn't. No, they didn't. No one said that. There's not a gang of people at Starbucks saying, yeah, we're mad because Biden made a promise to us six years ago because we, it, that didn't happen. That's absurd. This is the most absurd things you've ever heard, but this is how the propaganda works right now because it's just showing you the psychosis of where everyone's at. And really everyone just wants to be accepted. And if you want to be accepted, you don't need the right news. You just need to regurgitate what everyone else is hearing because that's familiarity, right? So you're measured on how your ability to regurgitate what the AP told you. <laughs> and that's mind control. That That's just, you, you could not get better at that. Will you repeat what I told you accurately? That's how you're measured. That's what the news is, right? You've seen that uh, that beautiful video where it's like, uh, our, uh, this is a threat to our democracy. And everyone's saying it in unison. It's, it's, you're looking at the heart of the penumbra, the real, the real life stuff here of what it takes. This isn't broken. This is how you do it. This is how you build a, a national tribe and get everyone on board. Richard J. Gatling invented this proprietary weapon in uh, 1862, 36-inch gun, 11-and-a-half-inch barrel. Uh, saw little action during the Civil War, but by 1866, it was adopted by the USS Army. So it, not only was this an instrument for the press and by the press, it was never even utilized in combat. The exact same thing happened with the Davy Crockett nuclear weapons, in which we've talked about in other, in other places. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Right, yeah, thanks for thanks for letting me do that. So so um I, I should I should have said this before the break, but oh well, we'll just let those people who, who didn't make it back uh, think that's real. This is not a real photo of uh Richard Gatling. This is an AI image. Um uh but the real Richard Gatling looks a lot like Kenny Kenny Rogers. I just want to point that out. And so y y y to me. I, I'm not sure which one I should have showed you. I wanted you to have more of a feel for what this might have looked like, um, and uh, I can't show you Kenny Rogers, but I did. Yeah, Kenny Rogers used a Gatling gun to defend the New York Times in the very first military psyop, and you learned it here. You you learned it here first. All right, so 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 James, you're saying that that the New York Times was a a field agent. Of the military. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I think so. Because keep in mind, I, I told you already 
that the Northern armies were recruiting. I'm going to show you some slides of this in a second, but they were recruiting all these people to join their militia, to, to join their gang. And they were doing that as much as six years. I, I, I think it's more like 10, but as much as six years before we can find actually posters where you're like, why are you recruiting before this is happening? And I think this is why, because on September 18th, 1851, that's 10 years before the civil war, the New York times was born. So publication printed six days a week, every day, except for Sunday. And on April 21st, uh, 1854, it was actually because of the ramping up of the Mexican-American War that the paper decided, hey, we, we need to go seven days a week. So this paper, this paper had a, a very important purpose for the propagation of information in a new nation. And that if you're going to establish some sort of, of sovereignty, you're going to need this, this kind of propaganda on your side. September 27th, that same year, the transatlantic steamer Arctic goes down. Fewer than 50 survived. The Times beat the Herald with an exclusive eyewitness report. And, and really, this kind of ended the competition for a national newspaper at the time. The AP won because they had a bigger scoop over this ship, the Arctic. The Arctic's been compared so many times to the Titanic. Um, it's considered uh, almost like a sister disaster that occurred earlier. And what's interesting about that is that the Titanic sinking also led to soaring uh, profits and readership for the Times, that the exact same thing happened. For whatever reason, the same paper had exclusive uh, eyewitness accounts of everything that was happening, that everything was seen to have been forced into their intel network. And keep in mind, we, we know that they had one from Montgomery, Alabama, all the way up to New York. And when you start to think about that Reuters had just, just been founded in that same decade in England, and, and we've already showed you uh, Rothschild already understood the power of this intel, you're starting to see that in order to form a country, the first weapon you would need is, is, is uh, media. You don't actually need weapons as much as you need media that that this really would be would be the way to the way to pull this off and we, people have been doing it in a while we just we're just not ready to accept that truth the hades of it so we don't see that thing but it's true this is the dude november 21st 1861 the times as a leading member of the ap arranged for the agency to be the official receiver of all war news from the government actually had a handshake agreement with the government we will be the exclusive distributor of your propaganda. This will give us the scoop. The Times was an arm of the military, and it really hasn't stopped. I don't think right now it's safe to say that the Times is a, a functioning arm of the military. I don't think that, it, that, that you need to own corporations now. You simply just need to have enough uh, people that can write stories and submit them to the AP and to Reuters over the news service. And that that's really how you control the media now. So it's not even necessary, I think, to like be embedded or to own a media company. Once you've installed this trough of the AP and the Reuters being the only two sources of news, and, and I don't think this is as true today. I'm saying uh, definitely back then and even, even into 1980s or so, um, this is really all you need. You just need this centralized trough. Um, Henry Jarvis Raymond, this dude who, who defended the New York Times with the Gatling gun, uh, he was a journalist and a politician. Uh, he was elected to the New York State Assembly in 1850 as a Republican. So different than, than what we might think. July 13, 1863, mobs riot in New York to protest the draft. More than 100 are killed that day. The Times being pro-union and anti-slavery is a leading target. Uh, and in Park Row, this place where their building was, Raymond defended the rifles, uh, defended the attacks with rifles and the Gatlin gun. And he did so well that that he convinced the rioters to t attack the Tribune instead, which they did, and they burnt the Tribune building down. So, <laughs> so not only did the uh, Gatling gun help them win, but it also took out their competition too. So it was very convenient. Uh, these are the Provost Guards. This is uh, I did not mean to have this picture ahead there, um, but uh, this this badge you see here is the the Provost Guard. The Provost Guard was this building. And this is where the lottery would take place. 
and the provost guard was uh was burnt down in this riot and i want you to look at something that's kind of interesting this comes back into the animism where it's like wow those things look the same but if you uh take a look at this these two towers right here in the rubble on the left are in most of the drawings of the day so this is this the provost building had to look like this it had to have these two spires. I say had to because there's at least four different etchings that have, I think I might have gotten rid of and just kept the best one. But this iconic image of this smoldering towers burning in flames is the birth of our union. And this happened in New York City. This is the provost office. And that these guards here were uh, the ones that were deciding who was going to be sacrificed to to go to war. And on the right, I, I have the wreckage of 9-11. And I, I, I'm not saying, look, they're exactly the same, but I just it's just interesting how this Amuraka theme, this idea of mass propaganda being utilized against its own people and causing a mass massive change to occur. The Civil War was all over in Hatton Island. These orange spots and this green spot are different highly violent activities that occurred over this five-year period in New York. People were uh, renting, renting hotel rooms strictly to set them on fire. Like, let's all go into this building and rent hotel rooms under different fake names. And we'll go in and we'll, we'll set the place on fire because we think that this is a pro-union hotel. Or it's owned by a guy that has a name that that we don't like. Something like that. The history is, though, there's a Mason Dixon line. <laughs> and and really that's just that's the propaganda you'd use to separate. If you want to know what really won the Civil War, it was it was equipment. The original gang of New York was the Union. The Union Army was the gang of New York. And and no one could could out bribe you as a member. You get free coat. You get a free hat. You get free boots. You get free pants. You get a free gun. You get money. You get food. You get shelter. You get protection. You have a ration of coffee, three Starbucks cups of coffee every day. You get a ration of whiskey. You get to loot strangers, rape, pillage, steal, and do whatever you want. You might even win a horse. Some of you will be chosen for the cavalry and you will win a horse. When, can you think about what it was like to be told you could win a horse back then? The hat that you see on the right is an authentic fez, part of the uniform of the 164th New York Infantry Regiment during the Civil War, also known as Cochrane's Irish Legion. And I'm showing you that because this was not about conglomerating everyone into a singular cult. This was about, yeah, if you want to call, if you want to gather a bunch of Irish, that's fine. Whatever colors you need them to wear, you guys want to wear kilts, I don't give a shit. Can you show up to this field and help help us shoot each other? And that can we can we just our goal is to eliminate Lupercalia by having Lupercalia. <laughs> right? Our goal is to eliminate evil in the world by having a pillage day. And if we host a pillage day and enough people come. This is going to get us where we need to go. It's going to give us the uh, fear index necessary for our already present propaganda underground railroad to elicit more control and bring everyone into a central trough of information. Can you can you fathom how fucking woke this is? Can you fathom how fucking woke it is for you to be a Rothschild back then? And understand your people so completely that it takes something as simple as a, a telegraph, a few stagecoaches, 
and an underground building in Montgomery that's pretending to be something that it's not, and that this is all it takes. And the whole time you're dealing with people that just got off a boat that were just finished trading each other's meat in Africa. And at the same time, you have these people that have uh, been piled on to even worse conditions than, than slave ships sometimes and brought over here and just dumped off because it's like, we're just, we're miserable. You're tired, you're weak. And we're bringing you here, Right. Bring me your tired and your weak. Think about it. What was Australia? What was America? This is where you dump your garbage. And if you dump the garbage in the right way, they're going to develop it for you. And you can come back at any time and just say, oh, this was ours the whole time. This was ours the whole time. Seeing how ahead these people are should be more astounding to us. And if it was, we would never have these thoughts where we're saying these people are stupid or these people keep messing up. They're not messing up. <laughs> They're not messing up. This is some of the most brilliant human compassion that you could, that you could elicit in a field in the wild. Through a voodoo spell where, where you're blowing white fucking powder in the face of people and telling them a story and it shocks them so much that they're dilated so much. They're just like, I accept this story. This story works for me. What, you're going to give me a fucking fez hat? Holy shit. My ears are cold. I would love a fez hat. I get to walk around with the rest of these guys. Get to wear a jock strap on the outside of my pants. I am freaking in, man. I, shin guards used to thrill me as a kid. Are you kidding? If I could have wore a jock strap on the outside of my jeans and wandered around town with a billy club and you would have paid me for that? Fuck yeah, man. That sounds like fun. Look at the pressure that was around and list now. Get your $100 bounty. Don't wait to be drafted. If you're drafted, you're not going to get the bounty. This is your only chance to win a free horse, my friends. The only chance for Calvary, we only need a few recruits, but you have to do it now. Come to the Provost Guard of Washington. The regiment is ready to give you a free horse. Two arms, two arms, men of Massachusetts. Your country is in danger. She calls on you. Are you going to let her down? And the entire time you're, you're coming out on the street and you're watching these parades go by, just like Hitler, you're watching these parades go by and people are like, look at our fez hats, man. You want a cool Fez hat? Well, you better join the lottery to get a free horse. And the whole time you're like, well, shit, should I sign up early? Should I sign up late? What should I do? Because over here they're promising me 100 but then a month later they're like, a conscription will soon commence. Avoid, secure the bounties. The forts need you. $402 bounty by the United States government. $75 by the state of New York. $75 additionally by the state. We were promising you, I will paint your car for $59.95. For $552, you will have all of these things. Act now while supplies last. You, you have to understand, no one was offering a deal like this. No one. Meanwhile, you're like, you know, you're out there with the... With the, I don't know. Let's say the uh, the the we'll call them the 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 creek. You found a tribe of creeks, and you're like, "Hey, can I join you?" And like, yes. You must tattoo your chin. <laughs> you must gather the pelts of seventeen bear and bring them on the winter. You know, and you're like, "Well." And then over here, it's like free coat, free hat, free boots, free pants, free guns, money, food, shelter, protection, coffee, whiskey, loot, winter, free horse. And $598. What are you going to do? Whose tribe are you going to join? Who do you think is going to win? <laughs> well, like do the math, right? You're doing the math. You're like, who's going to win? Because you're watching the streets of New York. You're watching these gangs parade down. You know who's winning. You fucking know who's winning. And you thought it was something when the dead rabbits have like seven in their gang. And now you're, you're looking at 300 people walking in step. Do you realize what a powerful thing that was? 
when everybody's like walking in step, holy shit, they're stomping at the same time, stomp the yard. You're feeling that? That's some power, man. It's some serious power. April 14th, 1861, the first war hero, the American Civil War. He could have been a Mason. He's got his hands stuck in his coat here. I know. Doesn't mean they could have been. Could have been. The main draw was Major Robert Anderson, the commander at Fort Sumter, South Carolina, which had been taken by Southern forces just eight days before. So he'd only been in command there eight days. Anderson arrived in New York as a rallying figure, and he brought along a somber souvenir, the 33-star flag. <laughs> oh, that had flown above the fort. So, <laughs> so, Mr. Anderson, Major Robert Anderson takes over Sumter, and for the very first time, they fly this flag that has 33 stars on it. <laughs> and, and and he's got his, his arm in it. He, and there's all these people joining tribes, but there's no such thing as Freemasons because that would that would that would not be like cool as fuck. Like if that was all part of it too. But like, yeah, of course it was. There wasn't a government yet. You weren't loyal to your army pension, were you? You were loyal to a gang that called themselves were the fucking army. And whatever it was that controlled that network, it, you wanted to be a part of that. You just did. And and. This flag over Fort Sumter, I think, is profound because of the shape. And before we get to the shape, I want to remind you that Major Anderson showed up at Sumter. He was there for eight days. For 33 hours, that's what, that's what it says. For 33 hours, uh, Fort Sumter was bombarded with, uh, with you know, Confederate forces, we'll call them. We'll call them that. And that uh, finally, uh, on April 14th, the day before tax day, it's a very auspicious day, as we've just learned in the last the last stream, especially with John the Baptist coming up. But the, this very, very day, he, uh, he surrenders. And this 33-star flag comes down. And not only does he surrender, he's, he's allowed to leave in peace. Him and all his men are allowed to leave in peace. So whoever is is fighting him is not savagely beating this man. They let him go. Let him go because the people in the South are like, can, can you just stop fucking with us? Can, can we just stop? Can we just stop fucking with each other? We're not here to uh, enslave you North, right? Can you just cut the shit? This gang of New York is not going to make it, says the South. You guys aren't going to make it. You're never going to be able to raise this much capital. I don't know where you're getting all this money for your Fez hats, but you're, it's not going to last. And they were wrong. Ultimately, the South was winning the Civil War, and ultimately, I think you would argue that it was rations that ended it. It was a lack of food, the lack of supplies, the lack of ammunition. That's what ended it. And when you look at, well, why did, where was the North getting all this stuff from? There's your hidden hand. There's your Rothschild. It doesn't have to be Rothschild. Please don't think that. But there's your true, true triumvirate, right? The intel of information below already knew who won the war because there was no war. The entire thing was just a propaganda stream of information collected and gathered and distributed in a very specific way that would uh, create the necessary gang of New York that could rule them all. And the South is like, I don't think you're going to make it. And the North is like, yeah, you don't know how much money we got. We got a lot of money. And why did they have a lot of money? Because they had set up a monopoly and in underground intel of information. And, <laughs> and if you think about, if Rothschild was buying war bonds back then, Think about how much money you could make when you're buying bonds before the war even starts, before even people even know, right? You've already decided. I want you to consider, I just want you to consider, I don't know this, but I want you to consider that it would not be that hard to send 33 able-bodied hidden hand members to different locations 
within this place and to say, we're starting a capital here. And that by starting a capital, all you would need is capital. And that the really all you need is a ceremonial building, something with a nice dome. And so 33 people built white boobies throughout America and that those 33 places became states. And those 33 states said, we are going to start the largest gang we've ever tried. And we're going to do it in America. And it's going to look a lot like what's already there because we're not that powerful. We can't just come in and level it and plant new people. We got to use the people that are there. So the government's going to look exactly like that. It's going to be the Haudenosaunee, which is not actually people of the Longhouse. I've been telling you that wrong. The word Haudenosaunee does not mean people of the Longhouse. It means people who are building the Longhouse. And that is such a crucial difference in translation. I apologize for getting that wrong. It is in Wikipedia wrong, <laughs> just so you know. But it is the people who are building the longhouse. And when you look at the bicameral system that was already in place, this is something Franklin, Washington, all of them spoke about. They brought the Iroquois to the new capital and said, will you accept this as a longhouse? Will you do that? And you're watching a propaganda war take place. And I think I think this is the closest proof I'm going to be able to give to you, which is which is coming up. As I told you, 33 stars in the Fort Sumter flag. I just want to take a moment to say thank you for letting me do what I do. I really love researching. When I'm about to drop on you, I think it's kind of cool. And I would not have been able to do it if I didn't have like four hours today to look at all this stuff. 33 stars in the Fort Sumter flag. This flag flew over Fort Sumter. The only time this flag was used in this confederation. Do you see the stars? This is a diamond pattern. For those of you who may not be watching, you're looking at a, an American flag that has 33 stars and they're in a diamond pattern. And to the left and the right of the diamond pattern, there are two, two towers. There are two, two stems. And the, the slide that I'm showing everyone right now, I want you to see that there's an etching that was drawn in 1863 in New York, and it's on the screen right now for the New York Times. <laughs> and that on the right, the flag has 13 stars, that the streets of New York were, were pushing their 13 star flag, but the star that was the flag that was flown over Fort Sumter by the Union, remember the Union came in and took it over for eight days, was this 33-star diamond flag pattern. And I, I want you to, to hear why I think this could be. On the left is an Iroquois Confederacy flag, the original flag of Al Muraka. And in the center is a diamond. It's, it's a tree. And that the tree is, is the Union of of these various tribes and that the Iroquois was five tribes. You're seeing four squares here, but that's because the central one was also a tribe and that these five families, these five tribes had conglomerated themselves into a confederacy that we know as the Iroquois Confederacy. And that the reason why you and I have in our history the words that the Union Army was fighting the confederacy is because they were fighting the fucking confederacy. They were fighting the original people that lived on this land. And they were fighting them for control because they wanted to control the information. And that the way that you would do that is to ceremonially destroy the Confederacy. And the way that you would ceremonially destroy that Confederacy is by creating a flag that incorporates that Confederacy and rebrands it as something else. And if you look at the stars and the stars and stripes of the 33 band, I hope that you won't find it too much of a stretch to simply just see this is the Iroquois Confederacy. You're focusing in on the central part of the Iroquois Confederacy, which is would be the symbolism of creating a federal government. That the early uh, Americans were capitalizing and taking over the Iroquois Confederacy and saying, you guys are the people of the longhouse, which means we need to make a house that's longer than yours. And we need to have a flag that looks like yours, but is better than yours. And that that's how we take over the country. We do not get to say, we're this now, and we believe in this now, and these are our icons, and we've brought the, 
you know, Artemis over and here's all the other things and Columbia. We can try those things as much as we can, but it's going to have to meld and mix into the local soil, the local land. And you're watching this happen, my friends. The flag on the right was uh, a psychological operation to invigorate and bring people on board into this other tribe that was forming this natural uh, national uh, Turkey based then later Eagle based uh, tribe. You were invigorating the Turkey of the native Americans and you were invigorating the Eagle of the Aztec Mexican culture that had these icons. And so you really didn't have a choice, but to incorporate and conglomerate with those things. This is how you, this is how you do it. All of these things ultimately led us to, to where we are now. That if it wasn't for AP and if it wasn't for Reuters, we would not have a Revenue Act of 1861. And as Thaddeus Stevens says, this bill is the most unpleasant one. But we perceive no way in which we can avoid it and sustain the government. The rebels who are now destroying or attempting to destroy this government have thrust upon this country many disagreeable things. Thaddeus is saying, and one of those is we get to tax you now. That that's what the Confederacy made us do. The people that were here before made us tax you. That's what that's what they're saying. A year later, the Confiscation Act of 1862, this is the second Confiscation Act. This, this would be the legal basis for President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. The Confiscation Act allowed the, the court to seize land, property, anyone who was a supporter of the Confederacy. And guess what? If you were a part of the Iroquois Confederacy, you were a supporter of the Confederacy. If you did not join that tribe that formed in New York City, your shit would be confiscated. You would be an outlaw. Just as Rome declared the definition of outlaw, right? One who's like the wolf. This is the head of the wolf. The same thing happened with the Confederacy. You were the wild ones. You were the feral ones, says this, and we will end you. you, you you're not going to make it here. Oops, I hit. Uh, wrong one. Not only did this work, it just kept going because, like I said before, in October of 1851, Paul Julius Reuter opened the Newswire Agency in London. Exact same thing happened. It led us to this place where we had, for the first time ever, global war, world war. And the only thing that you could have a global war is if you had global propaganda installed. That Archduke Ferdinand didn't mean a fucking thing to anyone. And that to claim that because he got shot, 25 million people are going to die is absurd. The only way you could pull this off is if you had a, an intel monopoly in place. And that's what Reuters is. Next time, we're going to talk about this. This is the rooster that fell from Notre Dame. And the reason why it's here in this story about the Civil War is this in 1860.